Okay, let's continue. But before we do that, let me just go back to the previous slide because I had part of Zechariah uh, chapter 10 passage chopped off. So the 11th, verse 11 here, on the bottom of your screen, he shall pass through the Nile, correction, he shall pass through the sea of troubles and strike down the waves of the sea and all the depths of the Nile shall be dried up. The pride of Assyria shall be laid low and the scepter of Egypt shall depart. Now let's move on to the Battle of Gog of Magog. So we're going to start off chapters 38 and 39, verse 1 and 38. The word of the Lord came to me, the word of Yahweh. Son of man, set your face toward Gog in the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army and horses and horsemen and all, your, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords, Persia, Kirsch, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all of his hordes, Beth, to Garma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes, many peoples are with you. So uh, first and foremost, let's just look at the, at the, the players, the states. Um, we got Gog, Meshach, Tubal, all from Turkey. Uh, Persia is Iran today. Kush, is, that's on the Nile River south of Egypt. Put is modern day Libya. Uh, Gomer is parts of Turkey, Armenia, Azerbaijan, so we'd be up in the uh, northeast section. Beth to, to Garma, that's also in the general area of Turkey, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. So let's continue. Uh, first of all, here's what it looks like on the map. And one thing to keep in mind, as once again uh, we have already seen, and that is the kingdom or the coalition of nations that are being put together by the Antichrist, um, even today being put together, um, they're all what? They're all surrounding the tiny state of Israel. So back to verse one, because the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face towards Gog of the land of Magog. So his name is Gog. He comes from the land of Magog. The chief prince, that's who he is, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. So uh, the chief prince, um, once again, prince uh, is a common biblical name that we saw used time and time again, especially in Daniel, for a spiritual power, a principality, a power. You've got to remember, there's war in the heavenlies. There's a lot going on in the heavenlies that we don't understand or don't see. Uh, but anyway, this is not only a prince, this is the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. This is the Antichrist. Now, the word chief, that has brought a little bit of confusion uh, amongst the theologians. Chief, first of all, the word, the Hebrew word for chief comes from ros. And ros means um, a head, like the head of a body, or by extension, the top of an object. Uh, high in status or authority, a leader, a chief source or, or origin, the first, the beginning, uh, to lift up the head uh, can also mean to take a census, but listen to this, it can also mean to, be, uh, to behead or to restore to a position. So in one sense, uh, the, uh, the word rosh in front, an adjective in front of this noun makes perfect sense because Who's the Antichrist? He is the chief leader of the kingdom of Satan. Uh, also, what was his means of uh, taking lives during persecutions and tribulation? Well, we spoke about that last time, to be had. Uh, also, what about Satan? Well, he's been kicked out of the kingdom of God. 
So to restore to a position, obviously that would be a nice agenda for him to at least elevate himself up. So in one sense, the Hebrew word rosh is just a perfect fit for this. But for some reason, the uh, New American Standard, American Standard, they decided not to translate rosh. Instead, they transliterated. So Ross became Rosh, the Prince of Rosh, of Meshach and Tubal. And all of a sudden now in English, it sounds like this is the Prince of three different areas. And it's not. It's not. And because this is transliterated as Rosh, and few, some theologians picked up on it and go, Rosh, Rush, Russia. It sounds like Russia. That's what it's all about. The, co the coming from the uttermost parts of the north, that's all about Russia coming to uh, invade Israel. And so this has led to a whole plethora of commentators saying, this is all about Russia invading Israel. Well, stop and think about it. What motivates the, the Antichrist? What motivates Satan? It's hatred. It's hatred of Jews. Now, while uh, Russia did have a very brief history under Joseph Stalin, a persecution of Jews. Russia is all about Russia. Russia is all about expanding its own territories, its own wealth, its own power. Um, it's not about, uh, the, their campaign is not about hatred of the Jews. So even just the whole reason and purpose behind the Antichrist kingdom would tell you that, uh, yes, it's not Russia. Um, and then of course, as we know, uh, the Islamic caliphate uh, has become more and more of the uh, reality of this prophecy. But anyway, let's move on. Verse four, and I will turn you about. So God is saying, I will turn you, Gog. I will turn you, Antichrist, about. I will turn you, Satan, about. I'm gonna put a hook into your jaws. I'm going to bring you out and all your army, your horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host of all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords, all this coalition that you're putting together. I'm going to pull you out. Persia, Cush, and Put, they're going to be with you guys. All of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all of his hordes, Beth to Garma, and from the uttermost parts of the earth. Now remember, the uttermost part, parts of the north, sorry, is from a Israeli perspective. So yeah, they're up north uh, with all his hordes. Many peoples are with you. So um, see if there's anything else we need to say here. No, other than verse five and six, uh, this great end times army will come from many nations, mostly from the north, but also from Northern uh, Africa and South of Egypt. Um, but uh, from the north part, Turkey, Central Asia, maybe the Caucasus as well. So let's move on. Verse seven, be ready and keep ready. This is God now talking to Gog. You and all your hosts that are assembled about you and be a guard for them. After many days, you will be mustered. Well, you can say that after many years, for many years. Uh, Satan has been working on putting together this coalition that then the Antichrist will be raised up and be able to quickly assemble in the latter years. In the latter years, uh, once again, uh, this is another way of saying it's the last days, the end of time. It leads no wiggle room. It's not something that's historical. This is the latter years, okay? You, Gog will go against the land that is restored from war. Uh, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. And we know that once again, this is Israel. Uh, this is the Israel that we see today, the nation of Israel. Um, the incomplete, but once again, it's a type and a foreshadow of the complete Israel. Um, that's been a continual waste, well, 150 years ago, Israel was what? It was nothing but wasteland. Jerusalem was what? A desolate city. So anyway, its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. Um, yeah, Israel in Israel, there is a false sense of security. And why? Because they are a respectable military strength and it's their military that's keeping 
the Arab nations from attacking them today. Verse 9, you will advance, coming on like a storm. So God is saying, God, I'm going to hook you. I'm going to drag you into my, my nation, my people. You're going to come on like a storm, verse 9. You will be like a cloud covering the land. You and all your hordes and many peoples with you. So it's going to be a very impressive army that's going to come up against Israel and against Jerusalem. In fact, it's going to be uh, uh, coming on like a storm. So from a human perspective, it's like this is doom. This is gloom. There's no way to get out of this. But this is God working. Okay, and all these nations and their combined forces, they're going to attack this tiny little state of Israel, this country of Israel that's about the size of our state of New Jersey. Why is that? Why would all this massive coalition of forces come to Israel and Jerusalem? Why? Because they hate Israel. They hate the Jewish people. They hate the Abrahamic covenant. And we have already explained that in past, so we don't need to go on. Verse 10, thus says the Lord God, on that day, thoughts will come into your mind and you will devise an evil scheme and say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will fall upon the quiet people who dwell securely, all of them dwelling without walls and having no bars or gates to seize, spoil, and to carry plunder, to turn your hand against the waste places that are now inhabited and the people who were gathered from all nations who have acquired livestock and goods, who dwell at the center of the earth. So uh, once again, this is going after modern day Israel and Lord God is gonna say, I'm gonna put thoughts, you're gonna think they're your thoughts, but I'm gonna put thoughts in your mind you're going to devise a scheme. You're going to go after the land of unwalled villages. Uh, now, Israel today, yes, there's a lot of security and a lot of fences, but how many cities are really walled? They're not. They're unwalled. Uh, and and you, Gog, is going to fall upon a quiet people who dwell securely, thinking that in their military strength, that everything is okay. Verse 13, Sheba and Didan, and the merchants of Tarshish, and all its leaders will say to you, so these are outlying nations, um, Sheba and Didan is uh, in Saudi Arabia, okay, Tarshish, um, it's really not clearly defined, what we do know is out to the west towards Europe, it could be Cyprus, or it could be some uh, something along the shoreline of the Mediterranean Sea. But anyway, these nations, they're going to say, have you come to see spoiled? Have you assembled your host to carry off plunder, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods and to seize great spoil? One thing we got to keep in mind in today's world, there are no surprise attacks. Everybody sees everything that's going on. Everything from satellite photos to newscast organizations to the internet and mainstream media and 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 social media. So um, there's going to be, you know, a lot of tough questions being thrown at the Antichrist as coalition. So one thing we need to keep in mind is that uh, these states are protesting and these states are not aligned with the Antichrist. The Antichrist is not a worldwide movement, even though it will have worldwide influence. So let's read on. Verse 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, thus says the Lord God, on that day. And we know what on that day means. That's the day of the Lord. Uh, it's the second coming. It's the parousia. On that day when my people Israel are dwelling securely, will you not know it? You will come from your place 
out of the uttermost parts of the north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great host, a mighty army, you will come up against my people. So God is saying, you're going to come up against my people, Israel, like a cloud covering the land. In the latter days, once again, we're talking about the end of times. I, I, Yahweh, I, the Lord, will bring you against my land, that the nations may know me when through you, O God, I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. Okay, once again, because this is the uttermost parts of the north and and this wrong translation or transliteration of Russia, you got a lot of commentators going, this is Russia, this is Russia. But no, uh, in its proper context, it's coming from North Turkey. You will come up against my people Israel and I will bring you against my land. So this is God doing this. This is Jacob's trouble coming into full swing. Let's read on verse 17. Thus says the Lord God, are you he of whom I spoke of and spoke in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who in those days prophesied for years that I would bring you against them? Yes, of course. I mean, God has used prophets throughout the Old Testament. This is nothing more than just a reiteration of what has already been prophesied. Verse 18, but own that day, the day of the Lord, the parousia, the day that God shall come against the land of Israel, declares the Lord God, my wrath will be roused in my anger, for in my jealousy and in my blazing wrath, I declare, on that day, there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep on the ground and all the people who are on the face of the earth shall quake at my presence and the mountains shall be thrown down and the cliffs shall fall and every wall shall tumble into the ground. I will summon a sword against Gog on all my mountains, declares the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. So there's going to even be confusion in Gog's army. With pestilence and bloodshed, I will enter into judgment with him. And I will rain upon him and his hordes and the many peoples who are with him, torrential rains and hailstorms, fire and sulfur. So I will show my greatness and my holiness and make myself known in the eyes of many nations. And then they will know that I am Yahweh, the Lord. This is all revelation. This is all the, the, uh, the sixth seal, the, the, the trumpets, the bowls that we're going to read about in Revelation. So let's move on. Because now we're going to enter into chapter 39. And we're going to shift just ever so slightly. Or we're going to go forward in time. And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And I will turn you about and drive you forward. Remember what we talked earlier, like a hook in his jaw. I will turn you about and drive you forward and bring you up to the uttermost parts of the north and lead you against the mountains of Israel. Okay, this is once again God reiterating that he's using Satan, he's using the Antichrist to fulfill his chastisement, which is going to be against a third of Israel, and his judgment, which, has, which we read in Zechariah, two-thirds will perish against Israel. Verse 3, Then I will strike your bow from your left hand and make your arrows drop out of your right hand. So 
after using the Antichrist to fulfill his purposes. So that being the uh, Jacob's trouble, the day of, uh, uh, of, of the abomination of desolation, uh, ceasing the daily sacrifice, um, and then after, towards the end of the tribulation, what is Jesus Christ going to do? He's going to destroy you. I will strike your bow from your left hand. I'll make your arrows drop out of your right hand. Psalms 110 verse 5. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpse. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. So we're talking global here. Verse four, you shall fall on the mountains of Israel, you and all your hordes and the peoples who are with you. I will give you to birds of prey of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. And we have read this in living color in Revelations 19 in the famous uh, Battle of Armageddon. Verse 17 where it says, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. So it's going to be utter destruction. Verse 5. You shall fall in the open field, for I have spoken, declares the Lord God. I will send fire on Magog and on those who dwell securely in the coastlands, and they shall know that I am the Lord Yahweh, and my holy name I will make known in the midst of my people Israel. That's a sad statement, but he's going to say, Israel's going to learn that my name is holy, and I will not let my holy name be profaned anymore. And the nations shall know that I am Yahweh, the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Behold, it is coming and it will be brought about, declares the Lord God. That is the day of which I have spoken. So making my holy name and my holy name, I will make known in the midst of my people. Israel, this carries a very deep and a very personal meaning to God, considering that the Jewish people long ago have even refused to utter the name that he shared with them, the name of what we think is Yahweh, and refused to even acknowledge Yeshua as the Messiah. And the nation shall know I'm Lord, the Holy One of Israel, being a global statement. This is the moment. This is the moment where God is establishing his kingdom. Now, there's something here that maybe wouldn't... Uh, it, it doesn't sh shout at us, it's not so obvious, but in all major translations, this is the only verse in the Bible where Yahweh says, I am the Holy One in Israel. All the other passages out there say, I am the Holy One of Israel. And speaks of him taking residence, him ta establishing his throne in Israel. Israel. This is the realization of the Lord's prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In verse eight, where he talks about this is, uh, that is the day of which I've spoken. That being the day of the Lord. That being the day that God spoke in the garden of Eden when Eve sinned against God and when God chastised uh, and gave a prophecy to both Eve and to uh, the serpent, um, where he says, I will put enmity between you 
and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. So this is the culmination, the fulfillment of the Messiah that is going to crush the head of Satan. Luke 4, 43, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, that that because that is why I was sent. So let's read on. Verse nine. Then those who dwell in the cities of Israel will go out and make fires of the weapons and burn them, shields and bucklers, bows and arrows, clubs and spears, and they will make fires of them for seven years so that they will not need to take wood out of the field or cut down any of the forests for they will make their fires of the weapons. They will seize the spoil of those who despoil them and plunder those who plunder them, declares the Lord God. This is the day spoken of through the prophets of the Old Testament. <clears throat> Here's three examples as spoken through the prophet Isaiah 2.4. And he will judge between the nations and will render decisions for many peoples. And they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they learn war. A time of everlasting peace. Spoken by the prophet Joel, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am a mighty man, spoken through the prophet Micah, and he will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty distant nations. Then they, all these nations, will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never, never, Again, will they train for war? Powerful, powerful prophecies of the kingdom of God. Verse 11, on that day, I will give to Gog a place for burial in Israel, the valley of the travelers east of the sea. They will block the travelers for their Gog and all of his multitude will be buried. It will be called the valley of Haman Gog. For seven months, the house of Israel will be burying them. For seven months, the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. All the people of the land will bury them and it will bring them, um, and it will bring them renown on the day that I show my glory, declares the Lord God. They will set apart men to travel through the land regularly and bury those travelers remaining on the face of the land so as to cleanse it. At the end of seven months, they will make the search. And when these travel through the land and anyone sees a human bone, then he shall set up a sign by it. Till the, bur till the barriers have buried it in the valley of Hammon Gog. Amona is also the name of the city. Thus shall they cleanse the land. So in verse 11, God is going to give Gog a place for burial. Gog will be physically killed. Obviously not spiritually because he will be thrown into the, the lake of fire and brimstone after the millennium. But his body will be unceremoniously buried in Israel, most likely in a mass grave. The burial in Israel is gonna be east of the sea. We're not sure what sea they're being referred to. It could be the Mediterranean, it could be the Dead Sea. Uh, uh, if it's the Dead Sea, or correction, the Mediterranean Sea, it could be in the wasteland south of the Dead Sea, or east of the Dead Sea, maybe some ravine a desolate ravine in the mountains east of the Dead Sea, which is today is modern day Jordan. But keep in mind, uh, 
Modern day Israel is not the, the totality of the promised land promised by God. So verse 12 through 16, for seven months, the house of Israel will be burying the carnage from the destruction of God destroying the battle of the Antichrist. It's going to be massive. Now, as I say, the promised land is much more than modern day Israel. And to answer that question, well, what is it? Well, we have to go back to the promise that God made to, a to Abram back then. This was the covenant uh, that God made where he had Abram uh, kill um, some, uh, some bulls and other uh, animals. And they were what? They were lined up. Uh, split in half and lined up and the Lord went through the middle and he said in verse 18, on that day the Lord, Yahweh, made a covenant with Abram saying, to your offspring. So this is the future, Israel. I give this land from the river of Egypt, which is Nile River, to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephraim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. So this will be the promised land that will be given to the Hebrew nation. Verse 17, as for you, son of man, Thus says the Lord God, and now this is kind of a reiteration, a recapitulation of what he's just talked about. Speak to the birds of every sort and to all the beasts of the field. Assemble and come, gather from all around to the sacrificial feast that I am preparing for you. A great sacrificial feast on the mountains of Israel. And you shall eat flesh and drink blood. You shall eat the flesh of of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, and of he goats, of bulls, all of them, fat beasts of Bashan. And you shall eat fat till you are filled and drink blood till you are drunk at the sacrificial feast that I am preparing for you. And you shall be filled at my table with horses and charioteers, charioteers, with mighty men, with all kinds of warriors, declares the Lord God. So once again, this is just a reiteration of the great uh, sacrificial feast that we've already read about in Revelations chapter 19. Um, so once again, this is telling us beyond a shadow of a doubt that the prophecy concerns the day of the Lord the second coming of Jesus Christ, the eschaton, the end of times. Verse 21. And I will set my glory among the nations and all the nations shall see my judgment that I have executed and my hand that I have laid on them. The house of Israel shall know that I am Yahweh, their God, from that day forward. And the nation shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity. Why? For their iniquity. Because they dealt so treacherously with me that I hid my face from them. And I gave them into the hand of their adversaries. And they all fell by the sword. I dealt with them according to their uncleanliness and their transgressions and hid my face from them. So, with Jacob's trouble comes the new covenant and this is the new covenant fulfilled. Jeremiah 31 talks about it. The days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by their hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant. Though I was a husband to them, 
This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares Yahweh. I will put my law into their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Yahweh because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I, listen to this, I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Now, why is this? This is because they will recognize Yeshua as their Messiah. Let's read on. A little more on the new covenant being fulfilled in Ezekiel uh, chapter 36, 22. Therefore say to the Israelites, this is, a, this is what the sovereign Yahweh says. It's not for your sake, people of Israel, <coughs> that I am going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name. And then the nations will know that I am Yahweh, declares the sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through you. You're going to be the example, Israel, before their eyes. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your land, which we read about in Isaiah chapter 11. I will sprinkle clean water on you. Remember, this is uh, the mikveh, the cleansing of the bride. And you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. Verse 25. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, now I will restore the fortunes of Jacob, that being of Israel, and have mercy on the whole house of Israel. And I will be jealous for my holy name. They shall not forget Correction, they shall forget their shame and all the treachery they have practiced against me when they dwell securely in their land with none to make them afraid. When I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them from their enemies' lands and through them have vindicated my holiness in the sight of many nations. So this is the, the execution and the outcome of Jacob's trouble. Um, the book, The Passover King by Travis Snow, I'm going to use a quote from him because I think he does a good job of, of just capturing all that's going on here. And he says, order comes from chaos, obedience from despair, Salvation from suffering. God's loving discipline will save Israel in the end. Verse 28. Then they, then they shall know that I am Yahweh their God because I sent them into exile among the nations and then I assembled them into their own land. I will leave none of them remaining among the nations anymore. And I will not hide my face anymore from them. When I pour my spirit upon the house of Israel, declares the Lord God. Wow. This is the end product. This is what has been promised 
through the through the ages, through the centuries. Once again, we go to the Old Testament prophets because this is nothing new in the Old Testament scripture. Zechariah 12, 10, and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. Later on in chapter 13, verse one, on that day, there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanliness. Springs of living water. Ezekiel 36, verse 27, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Chapter 37, 14, and I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it, declares the Lord. And then going all the way back to Deuteronomy before the children of Israel um, crossed the river Jordan into the promised land. Through Moses, God said, see now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. That's our sovereign Lord, our all-powerful Lord, our Lord that loves his people, who loves the world and gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him shall have everlasting life in his kingdom. So we're gonna end with two verses in Romans from the Apostle Paul. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. As we read in Zechariah, Two thirds will be destroyed, but one third will be saved, a remnant that will be purified and made holy and will enter into the new covenant of the Almighty God. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. So we'll be in there. That is Jacob's trouble. Uh, that is the battle against Gog of Magog, the Antichrist, the battle of Armageddon. And amen and amen. <laughs>